Praise him, you heavens and all that's above. Praise him, you angels and heavenly hosts. Let the whole earth praise him. Praise him, the sun, moon, and bright shining stars. Praise him, you heavens and waters and skies. Let the whole earth praise him. Any, I don't think there'll be anything any better than we all, when we all get to see Jesus face to face. And that is going to be one of the coolest things ever. But until that time, we get to witness this morning what I think is one of the coolest things ever. When we get to witness somebody who publicly says in front of all of his friends and family that he wants Jesus to be Lord of his life. And we get to watch that today with Hudson. First of all, I'd like to say I love uh, standing here and looking out and seeing all the faces of so many people who have uh, been there since Hudson was one year old um, to teach, to mentor, to guide, uh, to help us lead him to where he is today. 
Um, we've been on the, on the house hunt for, for about a month or so, and, and a few weeks back we saw a house that we just loved. Kids loved it, we loved it, we just fell in love with the place. And, and we put in an offer, and, and it turns out they accepted a different offer. And so Monet and I were like, we we got to sit the kids down and, and break the bad news to them. And so we sit them down and we tell them, hey, we we didn't get it. But, you know, this is a, a good lesson. This is a time where we learn we trust God's timing. And this was uh, while VBS was going on. And so um, Monet said, uh, our God is a God who we can trust. Trust. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, the kids recited back all those prompts that they said, and, and we were so proud because, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll be honest, they handled the uh, letdown better than we did. <laughs> and immediately after, after that, that news, after we tell them and they say, God is a, a God who we can trust, Hudson says, I want to get baptized on Sunday. And it felt really random, but at the same time, uh, you know, we, we turn to God, we, we um, proclaim God as our, our, Jesus as our Savior when, when times aren't the best, right? And so times weren't the best, he, he just got let down and, and he proclaims, I want to get baptized. And uh, I'll, I'll be honest, uh, personally, selfishly, I kind of pushed the topic a bit. Uh, we, it opened a dialogue, we spoke about it the next few weeks, um, we, we um, studied about it. And on Monday night, we were sitting around the dinner table, and Hudson just said again, I want to get baptized on Sunday. And Monet said, why do you want to get baptized on Sunday? And Hudson said, well, I want to um, put off the old me, and I want to become a new creation. And my mind was blown. That's a better answer than I would give. And so that's, that's when it clicked that this, this boy gets it. He knows what's going on. He understands what he's doing here uh, this morning. And so we're here this morning to, uh, to baptize Hudson. And Hudson, I'd, I'd like to ask you, do you believe uh, that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died for your sins? I do. Yes, you do. And you show it. Based on your good confession, I'm now going to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins. Great is our God, and sing with me how great is our God, and all see how great, how great. How great is our God, and sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Let's all pray together. Let's all stand and pray. Father in heaven, God, we stand in awe of you. You are so great and so awesome. And as we go through this life, we, we couldn't imagine doing life without you. You are our creator. We are your workmanship. And God, we all rejoice this morning with the angels in heaven and with you and, and your son. We all rejoice because another one has been snatched from the hands of the evil one. Father, we know that the kingdom of heaven is as to these little ones and the innocence and the faith of these young ones, Father, uh, we can learn a lot from. We thank you, God, for the faith of Hudson, for him wanting to become a new creation. We know this morning that the, the old man has gone, but the new man has come. And he is a, has been made a new creation this morning. And we worship you and we praise you for that. 
Because God, you work through your word and through your spirit and through Bible teachers and through preachers and through uh, members of your church um, to influence this young man and this family. And God, we praise you for that. Thank you, God, for us being able to experience this this morning, to experience new life. And God, walk with Hudson. Protect him from the evil one. Build a hedge around him, Lord, and, and help him to do awesome things for you. May he shine bright in this dark world. And God, may, may he um, always stand firm in his faith. Thank you, God, for Jesus. Thank you for hope. And thank you for your love. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated just for a second. <clears throat> I love that phrase from generation to generation. And I think about Hudson's daddy when he was that little right here at, at Hunter Hills. And that's kind of cool to, to be able to see that generation to generation, the growth of a family, the uniting of a family. You know, just like Hudson today, um, you know, the great man David, he recognized where his strength came from. Hear these words from 2 Samuel chapter 22. David sang to the Lord these words when the Lord, when the Lord delivered him from the hands of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. He said, the Lord is my rock, my fortress and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is a stronghold my refuge and my savior. From the violent people, you save me. I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise and have been saved from my enemies. The ways of death swirled about me, the torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I called out to my God. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came to his ears. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of the deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into the spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. The Lord lives. Praise be to my rock. Exalted be my God, the rock, my Savior. He is the God who avenges me, who puts the nations under me, who sets me free from my enemies. You exalted me above my foes. From a violent man, you rescued me. Therefore, I will praise you. Lord, among the nations, I will sing the praises of your name. Let's together stand and let's sing the praises of the God of our salvation. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. At the name of Jesus, every tongue confess. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow at his name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. At the name of Jesus, every tongue confess. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every knee shall bow at his name. He is the wonderful counselor, he is the mighty God, he is the everlasting father, he is the prince of peace. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. At the name of Jesus, every tongue confess. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow at his name. There is no other name. No name by which we say. There is no other name. Every knee shall bow at the name of Jesus, every tongue confess. 
At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every knee shall bow at his name. And every knee shall bow at his name. Every knee shall bow at his name. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. And shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Sing aloud to God, the people shall be for his throne. Hallelujah, sing aloud to God, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. And shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah. From the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, from the depths of the sea, let all creation praise His name. From the ends of the earth, from the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, from the depths of the sea, let all creation praise His name. To the Lord, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. And from the ends of the earth, and from the depths of the sea, let all creation praise His name. From the ends of the earth. To the Lord and shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. That the highest king would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in. No is love for me. Oh, is love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, is free. Jesus died for me. Yes. Oh, he died for me. Who the Son sets free. Oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place. Say again, I am who you say I am. 
the sun sets free, oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am, in my Father's house, there's a place for me, I'm a child Good morning. Uh, what an awesome morning God has already given us. Uh, it's time for us now to come to the table and take communion together. And just as a reminder, when those plates go around, uh, in each slot there's going to be two cups together. Uh, the top one is going to have grape juice. The bottom one uh, will be your bread. Uh, this morning as we begin our time, I want to go to John chapter 13, and I'm going to read verses 33 and 34. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. So Jesus is preparing his disciples for his death and his eventual departure. And so he gives them this new command, but what makes the command new is not the general concept of love. Of course, they had heard that many times over, that love was one of the most central aspects of the law and what it meant to follow God. But what made this new command, uh, this command new, is the measure of the love. And what Jesus tells his disciples is that they are to love one another as he has loved them. That what's going to mark them as a people is that they love each other the way that Christ has loved them. And this comes right before, of course, Christ lays his life down for them. And in fact, Jesus shows us that anticipation in John 15 where he says, greater love has no one than this, than to lay one's life down for their friends. And so as we come together in communion, we remember a couple of things. First of all, this great love that Jesus has given us, this love that we're unworthy of, that God himself, the creator of the universe, who is eternal, who is life, who knew no death, comes down to earth, becomes a human, and dies for us. And what we also remember here at this communion is that we've received this love of Christ, and we've received it, and we also give it to one another. That Jesus gives us his love, and he tells us to love one another as he has loved us. What, what Christ did through his death and what God did through Christ is he created a people who would take on Christ's spirit and they would love each other in this sacrificial way that Christ has loved us. And one thing that I love that we bring up a lot here at Hunter Hills is that this table is one that we share not just with each other who's sitting here in this room, but people all across the globe here on this Sunday who are taking communion who have also received this love of Christ and who have been given the spirit to love one another. There are so many people that even though we know nothing else about them, even though we're complete strangers, just the fact alone that we share the love of Christ is strong enough to be a bond so that we can love one another. I saw a really good example of this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we took our one of our main trips that we take each summer uh, to Impact. Uh, Impact is uh, where we go up to Lipscomb, uh, and, and we have a camp, but it's not really a camp. We spend a lot of time indoors, and it's on a college campus. Uh, so uh, it's, it's kind of a soft form of camp. But it's a great time up there. And, uh, and so we were up there, and very early on, even the, either the first or second day, uh, I went to breakfast, went to go see my students. And there was a student there that I didn't know, somebody who came from a different church. Uh, and so it turns out that one of our students, Danielle, was just walking to the cafeteria, noticed somebody else was walking uh, on their own. And so Danielle asked her uh, to come and eat breakfast with us. And so she did. And I thought that was nice enough. And then uh, the girl kept on showing up and she showed up to multiple meals and she kept on hanging out with our students. 
And by the end of the week, uh, she shared some things with me, Danielle, and some other students about her life. By the end of the week, she kept on showing up. She kept on being friends with us. And it was apparent by the end of the week that she that she just really needed love, that she needed a friend. And this girl had come uh, from Arkansas, and her youth ministry was in, was in Arkansas, uh, but she was just in, in need of some friends. And I don't think I completely knew the significance of everything that was going on until our very last nightly devotional, uh, where Hudson, uh, Hudson Lee said uh, that he had a note from her. Uh, she had written uh, a note for us, and so... <laughs> In the, uh, in the nightly devotional, Hudson gets up and he reads this letter from her. And it's just a beautiful letter that she wrote out uh, talking about how much she appreciated the way that our teens uh, loved her that week. How they were friends to her and showed her the love of Christ. And I was just so proud of the way that our students had been Christ to her. And the truth is, throughout that week, she had been Christ to us too. She had been our friend, and she showed up to support us in any way that she could. One really good example of this is, as many of you know, Evan Cockrell got baptized that week, and she made sure to be at that baptism. She asked us when the baptism was gonna be. She made sure that she was gonna show up and be there to support Evan, to support our youth ministry. And so she showed up to be at that baptism, and the note that she wrote was such a gift to us. And so by the end of that week, we shared this common bond with this girl from Arkansas that we had not known before. She was a stranger to us. We were strangers to her. But just because, just because she and our students shared that common bond of the love of Christ, they formed a deep friendship and a deep bond just over the course of that week. And so as we come together at the table, we remember that this is what God does. This is the joy, the salvation, the delight that he brings to us is he takes people who were in sin. He breaks them from that sin. He gives them his love so that then they can become like him and share this love with one another. Let's thank God. Father, um, we thank you so much for the joy and for the love that you give us in Christ Jesus. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so, God, we thank you for this love that you gave us, that you showed us. And we thank you that you fill us with your spirit so that we can go out and we can walk according to this way of love and according to this way of Christ. And so, God, I pray, uh, God, that as we come to this communion table, we come ready to simply be with you, to simply receive your love, and then to go out, to give that love to one another, to go out and to be um, who you were to us. God, we love you, and we thank you for this salvation that you give us in Christ Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. All to Jesus I surrender all, to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence there.
making his way up here. Uh, if we have children ages three years old to kindergarten, we have a special place of uh, worship and learning. Uh, they can just follow Miss Tori. She's headed there. She's right there. Uh, and they're just going to have a good time today. Good morning, Hunter Hills family. Are we not doing a thing where y'all say good morning back? That's okay. It's fine. It's fine. But anybody who wanted to, good morning, Hunter Hills family. Good morning. Good morning. I know everybody who gets up here says good morning and you have to say it a thousand times. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we're so glad that you're here uh, with us. You've seen a lot of our heart this morning and it's been uh, such a beautiful thing. If you haven't yet gone to the welcome desk in the lobby, we've got a gift that we'd like to give you just to uh, remember us by and express our appreciation for you. We hope that this morning is a blessing to you as it already has been to, uh, to all of us. Today we're starting a series on anxiety. And I want to do this uh, for two reasons. <clears throat> One is because we hear a lot about anxiety today, don't we? It's a, a common refrain. Um, and I think we hear more about it now than we used to. And the second reason is that the Bible says a lot about anxiety. It's almost as if God knew that we were going to have a constant struggle with anxiety. So in the coming weeks, we're going to consider types of anxiety, fear, worry. We're going to consider sources of anxiety. We're going to consider things that help, things that don't help. But today, I want to start off with the big picture. And the big picture uh, of anxiety, anxiety in the context of all of Scripture is a very simple thing. And it's this. God does not want us to be anxious. Anxiety is not a thing that he wants us to experience. He does not want us to worry. He does not want us to be afraid. To see this, we have to see the big story of Scripture all at once. But consequently, seeing the whole of Scripture turns out to be some of the best medicine for our anxiety that we have. Before we start, I want us to take a moment to de-stress, um, which I think is fitting for this morning. Let's take a moment of silent prayer together. And uh, in this prayer, in this time, if you just want to be quiet and enjoy silence, which we get so little of <laughs> in, in our lives, uh, that's, that's fine. If you have certain cares worries that you want to cast upon him, now would be a great time to do that. So let's, and it might help you to close your eyes, um, and I'm going to time us. All right, let's have a moment of silent prayer, and then I'll wrap it up with a prayer.
Isn't this nice? Isn't it amazing how just a moment of silence can have such a peaceful effect? Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, help us to rest in you this morning. We pray, build our confidence, not in ourselves or in our own strength, but in your goodness and your might. And help us to fall out of love with the things of this life and to fall deeper into love with you, the source of true life. You are a gift that no one can take away from us. You are in our hearts securely, and it is your peace that guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. To put anxiety into context, we need to start at the very beginning in Genesis 1. And we're going to start on the third day, halfway through the third day of creation. If you'll remember, day one, God creates light. Day two, the expanse between the waters. Day three, the dry land appears, and then the earth brings forth vegetation. Why are we starting here? You'll find out. Genesis 1, 11. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. I've always wondered why these details were placed here. The details about the seed and <clears throat> specifically about the fruit that has the seed within it. And I think one of the reasons for this detail is the author of Genesis is trying to show us God's original provision. How God, at the very beginning, intended to provide for his people. God called the trees to grow and they had fruit on them with seed in the fruit. And then guess what's going to happen? The fruit will fall to the ground, most of it. It will rot. The seed will go into the ground. And another tree will grow up from that seed, producing way more fruit. How many apples can one apple produce? It's insane. I mean, exponentially... It is insane how one little piece of fruit has the power to sustain. I think this is the idea. God, uh, the author of Genesis is showing us, look how God has provided for you. The power of one piece of fruit. That God is not just providing sustenance for today. Not in the beginning, not just daily bread. Not just even a stockpile of food for a year but theoretically he is providing sustenance for his people forever it can go on and on and on abundantly God is the God of abundant life God is the God of abundant provision look at uh, Genesis 129 after the creation of man and woman and God said, Behold, I have given every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. See, this is God's provision. And I think this is why the detail is given to us, because this provision is extra. This provision is beyond enough. God has abundantly provided an endless source of food. And I think it's right for us to read into this more than just food. That this is, this is not just that his, his design was so that man could have fruit forever and ever and ever. I think it is an image much deeper than that about God's intention behind creation to care for his people. To meet their every need. To fill them up with this abundance. You see, the image isn't that God got the ball rolling with creation and then he plopped man down and said, hey, see what you can, see what you can do with this. 
That's a, that would be in a very, very American twist on the story, right? God created us in the struggle, and we've got, by our own grit, we've got to somehow make a way for ourselves. That's not the story here. It's that you were made from nothing. He plopped you down in his good garden to provide for your every need. The end. That's great. <clears throat> Let's see one more time how, this, uh, how God is providing so that it sinks in. Genesis 2, 8. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. You see that? God made them spring up. And it was not just, hey, this will get you by. It was, this is beautiful just to look at, and it's really good for food. God did not just drop us in the middle of a hostile planet to fend for ourselves. He made this planet for us, to be our home, to take care of us. And more than that, God was there in the garden to supply every need, to fill up everything that a human could ever want. And I think this is represented to us in the tree of life, that somehow God is the tree of life. He's the source of everything that a human could need, all that you need for life, full and abundant, lacking nothing physically, emotionally, relationally. It is all found in God, in the tree of life, and he gives abundantly. So, does that describe the world you and I live in right now? No, something went wrong in this story. And what went wrong, we call sin. Two sins to be exact. First, Adam and Eve in Genesis 1 are given dominion over all the earth and over all the animals. And yet, in chapter 3, we see them listening to an animal and doing what that animal tells them to do. And the second sin is unbelief. You see, all through Genesis chapter 1, God makes something and he sees that it is good. Not evil. Good. This is the world that God created. And we just read the food that he provided for them was good. Not evil. It was good. All along, God had been bringing his people only good. Their only experience up to, up to Genesis 3 is only good. That's all. And then they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I think the idea here is to show us that they did not trust that God had provided good for them. In fact, we see what, what is the, the lie of the serpent? He says, oh, oh, God told you you couldn't have that, huh? Well, he's holding back from you. You know why? Because he knows there's something good on the other side that he doesn't want you to have. And so when Eve saw that it was good, that was mankind saying, hey, we'll be the judge of what's good. We'll decide for ourselves whether or not God has this provision that he says he has. Let's see what else is out there. And so this original sin is them not trusting that his provision was good. Remember what we just saw, his provision was abundant. To, to fill them up with everything a human could ever want. You see the irony here? They lost this good provision because while they had this perfect provision, they did not trust that it was perfect and good. The tree of life was, in fact, good enough. It was all the good that God can give, but they did not think the tree of life was good enough for them. They did not trust that his provision for them was full. And so what happened? They are exiled from the tree of life. Let's look at a couple passages in Genesis 3 to see what is the result of not trusting God to provide. Genesis 3, 7. 
Then the eyes of both of them were opened. This is after they ate the fruit. And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. How'd they get naked? Well, God made them that way. You see, immediately they say, ooh, there's something about the, the way God made things that just isn't good, and they tried to cover it up. Genesis 3:17. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. You see the point here. The result of sin is being cut off from God's perfect provision. God, of course, did not stop providing. It's not that he stopped altogether to provide for them. By his grace, he covered them with his own garments. By his grace, he continued to bless that lineage. And while the cursed ground brought forth famine after famine, we see throughout the book of Genesis, God is there for his people to sustain them through that famine. He will bless the ground before them because he is preserving them. But at this point, exiled from the tree of life, having to work a cursed ground, we no longer receive God's full provision. So this is the point. All fear, all worry, all anxiety is a result of sin. It was not God's original design. It was not God's original design that we should fear the future. Because in his provision, the future was perfectly secure. It was not God's design that we should chase after so many unnecessary things that are so stressful and keep us so busy because when you're near to the tree of life you don't have to chase after anything to be full it was not God's design that we would be afraid of each other that we would fear the opinion of man because being near to the tree of life is to have unity with man and is to be so near to God as to be perfectly secure. And it was not God's original design that humans would sin and in sinning create for themselves all kinds of anxieties. We begin at the beginning of the story because we need to put anxiety into context. In God's great design, there is no place for anxiety. Anxiety is the result of human sin. Because the result of human sin is a cursed world and exile from the tree of life. And the good news that we're going to unpack in the weeks to come regarding anxiety is that the story is not yet finished. And I want to read you the end of the story. Go to Revelation 21. And we'll do a reading from 21 and then from 22. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, not a cursed earth, but a restored earth. For the first heaven and the first earth, the cursed earth, passed away, and the sea was no more. You see it there. God's restoration of the earth that he cursed because of man's sin which is the source of so much of our fear, so much of our worry, that this life in this earth is not secure. And we, we don't want to live in some fantasy with our head in the clouds as if this life is going to turn out exactly as we dreamed that it would, because it's not. Pain will come. All kinds of terrible things can happen in this cursed world. But there is coming a day when he will restore. He will renew it. Verse 2, And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, 
prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. There will be a full restoration, a full reconciliation to the God that we've sinned against by the grace, by his grace, by the blood of Jesus on the cross. And here's, here it is in verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, every anxious tear, every sad tear, gone. Death will be no more. Isn't that so much the source of our fear? At the very bottom of it. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. This cursed earth has passed away. And now look at Revelation 22, verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Hey, these would be great verses to read when you begin to feel anxious. That's so peaceful. Through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will, will there be anything accursed no longer will the ground be cursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face. You know that's the greatest thing that could ever happen, to see the face of God. To see the face of God in Scripture is uh, to eat of the tree of life. It is to come face to face with your every desire. It's all there in his face. Everything you're afraid of losing, it's there in its fullness in his face. Verse 5, And night will be no more. They will need no light or lamp light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever you see how the story ends the cursed earth is renewed or replaced and then there is the tree of life we're brought back in what went so wrong that has caused us to live lives where we have to constantly battle fear God is going to make it new. He's going to fix it. And as it turns out, this is the way that he has helped us with our fears today. And that's what we're going to be talking about in the weeks to come. What do we do in the meantime between God's original creation and God's restored creation? What do we do in the meantime? The praise team can go ahead and come on up. We're going to sing a song about God's presence. You might say we're going to sing about the tree of life because when we are aware of God's presence, it is like being under the shade of the tree of life and eating from its fruit. And as many of you have experienced, when you have an unusual awareness of God's presence, there is no fear in that moment. None whatsoever. You're likely to commit things to him that later you'll regret. Because in that moment, he's right there. And as close as you can get in this life on this cursed earth, you're seeing him face to face. And there's no fear there. So church, let's flee now from our anxieties to the presence of God as we stand and as we sing. Lay your burden down, every care you carry, and come to the table of grace, for there is mercy. Come just as you are, we are all unworthy to enter the presence of God. For he is 
and the joy he brings. He has definitely been in this place today. Today's been a great day. I want to invite the Perkins family. I'm going to be Stephen today. I'm going to invite the Perkins family to join me here on the stage. Dave and Karen, Gunner, Ellie, and Evelyn. You don't get to stay down there. You got to come up here. I was thinking as Stephen was telling the story of Danielle inviting someone to come and be a part of their group and ha what happened because of that single invitation. I think it was a single invitation by someone at the park. I think it was Morgan Clark invited them to come and visit Hunter Hills. And now a year later, they are still at Hunter Hills. But the mean-spirited United States Marine Corps <laughs> has determined that it is necessary for them to go to another location. They're going to be moving to Tampa, leaving tomorrow, uh, heading to Tampa. You know, God brings families to Hunter Hills on a pretty regular basis, but I can truly say it's been a long time since he brought one like the Perkins family. Their love for God it's so evident in every single thing they do. Their love for God compelled them not to just come here and sit on the back row for their year, but it compelled them to serve. You just saw Karen standing up there on the stage with a praise team. She also taught Bible classes in costume, I think I heard one time. Um, Dave taught the 20s and 30s. He was not in costume, but he still taught the 20s and 30s. And what I'm going to remember, one of the things I'm going to remember is, is I called Dave Mark for the first two months that he was here. So he will always be Mark, who goes by Dave. Um, so when they come back, be sure you welcome Mark and Karen. 
Gunner, Ellie, and Evelyn uh, back. And I know God's going to bring them back at some point in time. And I can't wait for that to happen. But I'm going to give Mark a second to share with you. Thank you. Uh, I just want to thank God for bringing us here. You know, like, uh, especially being a military family, you never know where you're going to end up. And uh, searching for a new church is, is always a, an endeavor. Um, and this year, or this season, it seemed like it was more difficult. It took us longer than normal. And then Morgan invited uh, Karen to come here. And, uh, you know, it, it wasn't our typical church uh, coming from an independent fundamental Baptist church upbringing and, and that sort of thing. Um, and I only say that for you to realize when we came here, we didn't realize what kind of church it was. We just were invited and we felt led to come. Um, but instantly when we came here, uh, there was three things that really, I think, stand out that I think are worth mentioning. One is the love, uh, two is truth, and then three is honesty. When you first come here, you can't help but see the overwhelming love that from uh, Will, the elders, and each individual member uh, pours out into each person. And I can't thank you all enough as we you know, uh, continue to grow in our faith, continue to try living more pure for Jesus, and so that way others can see the light through us. I can't thank you all enough. The love, whether it's when Verena first welcomes you when you first walk in, and uh, whether you're a hugger or not, you'll, before the year is up, you know, we become a hugger, you know? Um, she shows the love, and then it's each individual here. I can't thank you enough. Um, like, there's so many people that we are so thankful for here for the love, uh, for the truth. You know, I, I told you I come from a different background. So when I first was looking at joining, uh, talking to folks, I was like, hey, there's a few things that I'm a little different on. And they're like, hey, look, none of that matters. What matters is what's in the Bible. And we'll use the Bible as our, as our, our go-to. It's not man, but it's the truth. And nothing's been more powerful in my mind in a church than when the Bible is the truth. And it's not based off of you know, whatever, it's based off of the Bible. So I can't thank you enough for that. And then honesty, uh, the greatest hindrance for me in my life, and I, I think it's probably true for everyone, for our lives, is when we're not honest about who we are and where we're at in our Christian walk. Uh, but really quickly went out to eat with uh, Pastor Will and we talked and we talked about honesty and just the honesty here each person has about who they are, where their walk is, so that way we can walk a more pure life. Uh, I can't thank you enough uh, for that. And it's been evident throughout the whole year here. And it's greatly helped us in our walk. So I thank you all uh, for our time here and just helping us in growing. And hopefully we've uh, been helpful for you all. Thank you. I don't know who's blessed who the most. Whether we've been a blessing to you or you've been a blessing to us. That's what's cool. It just works both ways. I want to invite the shepherds and their wives, um, the praise team, if y'all want to step down here as well. Um, and then anyone else who would like to join us up here, you're welcome to do that. Um, and let's pray over this good family. Before we do that, let's read this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, we thank you today that a year ago you brought the Perkins family to Hunter Hills. And Father, we thank you for the such powerful influence they've been on us. We thank you for their hearts, their love for you. That is so evident in everything they do. And Father, we thank you for that. And we've been the recipients of that. And Father, we pray that the Hunter Hills family has been a blessing to them. And as they leave us and go to a new place, Lord, I just pray you'll wrap your arms around them and protect them. As they travel to move, I pray you'll protect them. As they move into a new home, as the kids make new friends. But most of all, Lord, I pray that they will find a place where they can serve as they've served here. 
And so, Lord, we pray you'll open that door of opportunity for them. So we pray that you'll take care of them until we get to see them again. And we will already thank you in advance for when that will be. Thank you for loving us. And as always, thank you for giving us Jesus through whom we pray. Amen. So we're going to let their farewell be. Is the, is the thing up there the, the uh, benediction? I think we can. All right, so, Gunner, you want, you want to say it with me? Here we go. We are a chosen, chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who belongs to God, that me they declare the praises of him who calls us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once we are not people, but now we are God's people. Once we did not receive mercy, but now we have received mercy. You are sent. <laughs>